Romans chapter 13, and uh, we're going to read verses 1 through 10, and uh, we'll see what the Lord has for us today. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. I'm sorry, I have to look again here, because my, my Bible is so old, it's ripped and torn, and it's taped together in certain parts, and this is one of those parts that's kind of ripped and torn, so I'm trying to see what it says. <laughs> for... For these, is it these or there? There, there thank you. <laughs> there is no, uh, uh, no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. If you want to be unafraid of the authority, do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers, attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So we see here in this passage, and what we're going to attempt to do in the time that we have, I'm not sure that we'll be able to do everything we attempt to do today, uh, but we're going to simply uh, teach from this passage, uh, explain the meaning of the text, uh, expound upon it, and then we're going to come back at the end, the very end of the service, uh, the last couple of five minutes or so, and explain to you what we mean by the title that we have given you uh, regarding uh, the danger of partisan and identity politics in a constitutional republic. We'll explain what that means in the light of Romans chapter 13, and then we will make a simple application and close. Uh, he's, he's doing this in this passage. He has two parallel truths that are going through the text. Those two parallel truths are this. He is uh, citing for us the role and responsibility of government with its power and with its limitations. And he is also citing for us the responsibility of us as Christian citizens, our response to this governing authority. And the first thing we want to establish is this. He says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So the first question we have to ask is this question. Uh, does, does God mean here in verse number 1 and verse number 2 that the governing authorities have unlimited power, unlimited authority, and if so, does that mean also that we as citizens have a duty to give un unlimited submission or unlimited obedience to the governing authorities? Because when you read it in the text, that's what it appears to be saying. And also, uh, throughout history, this has been a big debate among Christians about the extent of our obedience and the extent of our submission, as well as the extent of the authority and power of government. And I want you to notice, first of all, that, the, that what the scripture states in verse 1, no authority, there's, that there's no authority except from God. Now let, let's back up for just a moment. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. First of all, we have to understand, um, you know, people will sometimes say, well, we shouldn't talk about politics in church. Well, you can talk about politics in church because Roman th Romans 13 uh, passages like 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, among other texts, does address the issue of government and politics 
Therefore, it is okay if we're going to speak from all Scripture. And uh, the thing that we have to remember when we're talking about nations, when we're talking about government, uh, when we're talking about the rule of law or laws, we have to remember that God is the creator of all of these things. Who is it that created nations? Who is it that designed governments to exist among men? Well, it is God. We can read that in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapters 9, 10, and 11. Uh, Paul, when he is preaching to the Athenian philosophers in Acts 17, he gives them a history lesson. And he tells them in verse 24 how God created uh, the earth and everything that is in it. And then he goes down into verse 26 and he begins to talk about how that God from one blood or from one man, talking about Adam, that he made every nation of men that are on the face of the earth and that he determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling. And so we see in that passage that it is God who from Adam created nations across the entire earth and he is the one that said when they would exist and, to, uh, and when they would fall, when they would rise, when they would fall and the boundaries of the borders that those nations would have. So first of all, it is, it is important to our theological understanding and our biblical worldview to see that God is involved in the affairs of people in every aspect. It's not as though God is only involved in the church and nothing outside of the church. God is involved in a civil society. God is involved among the nations of the earth. Now the reason this is important for us to understand the origin of government, the origin of nations, the origin of the rule of law is God. He is the source. Now this is important because we have to ask ourselves, what is law? Or, uh, perhaps a better question, what is the source of law? And you have three options. Either the source of law is the state, the government, or the source of law is human reasoning and intellect. Or the source of law is God. Now if we believe that the source of law is the state or the source of law is human conscience, then we can change the law at any point in time because we are the arbitrators of that law according to our conscience or according to the state. But if God is the author, the originator, the source of law, then we cannot change law because nobody is an arbitrator over God. For God is the highest authority and the supreme authority. Therefore, all law must originate from or flow from the law of God or the commands of God. So that the laws of men are to act in fact as just as we are created in the image of God and we are to mirror God in every aspect of our lives. Just as that is true, the, the, that we in a civil society, the laws of uh, human laws are to mirror the laws of God. They are to image the laws of God. And if they do not image the laws of God, there is no law at all because there is no law that is superior to the law of God. So we have to ask ourselves that how can we righteously rule or righteously govern if we do not know the one who originated government? How can we rightly rule if we don't know the law of the one who created authority? Right? And, and, and you can see real quickly because the more our nation becomes a secular nation and the less a Christian nation, the more we secularize our society and preach the humanism religion to our children in schools, the more we do humanism in our school and get away from uh, the God of Scripture, then we can begin to uh, get away from the, the source of the rule of law and, and, and the understanding that law cannot be changed because God is the superior authority over all. So it's important for us to understand, number one, God is the source. And you'll notice right away that it says there's no authority except from God. And that the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So here you have two key words. From God and by God. From God and by God. Now, now here's the question. 
Um, if, 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 if the authorities that exist are appointed by God or from God, then here's the, here's the question is this. We can see right away that the authority of human government is number one, delegated. It's from God. And if authority is delegated, what does that necessarily mean? It necessarily means that if I am in charge and I'm the one delegating that authority to you, it means that your authority is limited by the higher authority. So that the lesser authority doesn't have greater authority than the ultimate authority. The ultimate authority in this case is who? God. So God is the supreme authority. His law is the supreme law. And all we are is to carry out the, the, uh, uh, the, the mirror image of the God of the law that we serve. And so we see number two, or we see two things again. Number one, we see the fact that um, it is both delegated and it is limited. That the, the authorities that be do not have any more authority than what God has assigned to them. Now the reason that's important is because in the remainder of the passage, He's going to show us the purpose of government and the authority that God did give to government. And by seeing that, we also see, therefore, the limitations of the role of that government, the limitations of its power, the limitations of its authority. So we see, number one, the delegation of authority, the limitation of authority. Now, the other reason this is important to see, I'm going to give you some biblical examples very briefly. Um, to, to illustrate for you that we, we cannot believe that the government has unlimited authority and that we are to give unlimited submission to the governing authorities. Okay? Let me give you some quick examples, all right? And, and we're not going to turn to a lot of scriptures because I've got limited time. So we go through Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament alike, and we see biblical examples of people of God who resisted the governing authorities and God blessed them and rewarded them for it. For example, in Exodus chapter 1, we have the, the example of the, uh, the king or the pharaoh had told, the king of Egypt had told the midwives of, of, of the Hebrews that they were to kill all the male children that were born. So let the female children live but kill the male children. Uh, so they couldn't populate, obviously. And, uh, and they did not do it. They didn't comply. And we see in that passage that God blessed them, rewarded them with households. Um, you go on and you can see uh, Joshua chapter 2. And we see how Rahab, the harlot, hid the spies of Israel. In, in, the, in, the, in the, the house of harlotry and hid them. And uh, when the messengers or the authorities came from the king, she lied and said, yeah, well, they, they, they were here, then they left, and they went down over this way, but the whole time they were up on her rooftop hiding. Of course, she was a harlot, so lying was the least of her troubles, right? You go on and you can find examples of, uh, of Daniel. There was an edict given by King Darius and the, where they could not pray to any other man or to any other god than Darius himself. And the Bible says, Daniel 6, verse 10, I encourage you to read it on your own time. It says that it is basically as soon as that was signed, that edict was signed, you know what Daniel did? I mean, in, in open defiance, he went up to his home, went up to the rooftop, opened the window, and faced Jerusalem and prayed three times that day in open defiance of the edict of the king. We know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did the same thing or similar thing in Daniel chapter 3 in which the king had told them, Nebuchadnezzar, told them to bow down to the statue, worship their gods, and they did not. And of course, were thrown into the fiery furnace. God spared them. You could go on and on. 1 Kings 18 uh, I believe it is where Obadiah, who was the chief of 
King Ahab's household. And Ahab and Jezebel were out killing the prophets of the Lord. And you know what Obadiah did as the servant of King Ahab? You know what he did? He hid prophets. <laughs> he hid the prophets of the Lord from, from Ahab and Jezebel. You can talk about John the Baptist who openly rebuked Herod for his sin because he had taken Herodias, who was his brother Philip's wife, and had seduced her, committed adultery, and then had her divorce him and marry him. And, and John the Baptist rebuked him openly for his sin and for his unlawful behavior. And then in the New Testament... The entire history, you realize the entire history of the church is filled with examples of the church suffering persecution at the hands of the state. For example, in Acts chapter 4 and 5, when the rulers had told uh, the disciples to no longer preach or teach in the name of Jesus, and then they said we ought to obey God rather than men, Acts chapter 5 verse 29. Right? And, the, and the whole history of the Christian church has been a history of persecution at the hands of the state because the church would not comply with certain uh, restrictions that were placed upon it by governing officials. So whether you're looking at the protection of human life, our prayer and worship, the preaching and teaching of the Word of God, there were times in history where God condoned the resistance of people to the governing authorities. So if, in fact, God is saying here that we have to obey them in all things at all times, then there's inconsistency in Scripture. The other example we can give of this is, is very, let's, let's appeal, appeal to your, your thinking, your reasoning. We know that God has instituted three things. He is the originator, the source of these three things. Of family, of church, and of the government. Now, let me ask you a question. Does the, do church authorities, pastors and elders, do they have unlimited authority and do you have to give pastors and elders unlimited submission? No. We only have authority so far as God permits us to have authority according to Scripture. Now we all understand that. Let me ask you another question. The, the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Does that mean that the wife and the children are to submit to the, the husband and the father in all things? Does he have unlimited authority and they must give unlimited submission to him? No. He is to be the head of the wife like Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body, he goes on to say. Uh, in other words, that, that headship, that leadership is a sacrificial, serving, loving, giving one, not a dictatorial, tyrannical one. Now, we understand it in the home, and we understand it in the, well, we don't always understand it in the church, and we'll deal with that later. But we understand it, I think, in the home and in the church, but when it comes to the government, somehow we have a different understanding that they have unlimited authority, and we have to give unlimited obedience. Let me give you another example, just from history. Did you realize that if the founding fathers of this country believed that this taught unlimited authority and unlimited submission by society, did you realize we would have no United States of America? There would be no Declaration of Independence. Because what was the Declaration of Independence all about? Right? Basically, they did this. They said... Uh, based on the laws of nature and of nature's God, and because all men are created equal, because we've been endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights that includes life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, uh, we have a right to not submit to your government and to form our own government because you're a lawless government. And then they gave 27 points uh, indictments against King George III 
indicting him for his abuses of authority because he was a lawless governor. I think if, if some Christians today had lived back then, they would have sided with the British and fought against the colonialists. Or how about in World War II? Let, let's go back to uh, let's go back to Germany. Let's go back to the Third Reich. Let's go back to Hitler. It was the common view among the Lutheran Christians within Germany that they should submit to the authority that is there. That authority at the time being Hitler, who was a duly elected official, and they would not resist him, although he killed, what was it, 11 million people, it's estimated that. Slaughtered an, an entire ethnic group, or attempted to slaughter an entire ethnic group. And yet the church cited Romans chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, that they had to submit to the governing authorities. Do you think that they had to submit to the governing authorities when those governing authorities were murdering people? Is there not a higher authority than those governing authorities? Is there not a higher law than the laws of those governing authorities? Which is why you read about a man, also in Germany at that time, a Lutheran theologian named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer opposed and resisted Hitler and the Third Reich. And he spoke publicly against them, spoke on the radio against them, and they cut his program off because of his resistance to them. He wrote against them, published against them, spoke against them. In fact, he was involved in a plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler. That's my kind of preacher. <laughs> Think about that. He realized that there was a higher authority than Adolf Hitler. And there's a higher rule of law than Adolf Hitler. And that all authorities that are there are there from God and by God. And without God, they cannot exist. But somehow we've been lulled to sleep just to think, well, we just got to roll over and surrender. And we become, you know, nothing but pacifists. This creates this, this lukewarm temperament within the church. And, you know, perhaps the day will come when God will test the uh, resolve of our convictions and the resolve of our beliefs to where maybe we'll be tested to see if we will stand up and preach the Word when they tell us not to or to preach certain biblical truths when they tell us not to speak biblical truth. Perhaps that day will come where we will be tested as our forefathers were to see if we will stay resolved in our beliefs in Scripture. Verse 3 and 4. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. There's two things I want to bring out from here. Number one, notice the redundancy. Good and evil is mentioned three times. Both of those words are mentioned three times in verses uh, three and four. Good and evil. What does this mean? It means that government must necessarily be morally good. It must necessarily be able to separate the good from the evil. Because as Ecclesiastes says, you cannot make straight what God has made crooked. If God says something is wrong, it's wrong. If God says something is perverse, it's perverse. You cannot take the things that God has made crooked and then try to make them straight. And, and we see here that there has to be moral leadership in government. They are deciding between good and evil. So it cannot be that government... Government can never punish good and reward evil. It must always reward good and punish evil. 
when government rewards evil and punishes good, it then becomes an abuse of power. Do we have any examples of that today? Well, sure we do. We have, we have a whole uh, industry, much like the Holocaust, that just wipes out an entire generation of, of people in the womb. 61 million deaths by abortion since 1973, just within this country alone. Well, that is punishing good and rewarding evil. How is it doing that? It is rewarding the murderers who execute murder upon an innocent life in a womb. It is punishing good and promoting evil. That's just one example. There's, there's aspects of the welfare state that uh, rewards sin. It rewards sinful behavior and it rewards the, the dissolution of or the dissolving of the, the American family by incentivizing people to not get married and to just have children. That is rewarding evil and punishing good. And you could go on from there uh, to, to any number of things, right? Defunding the police, that's punishing good law-abiding citizens and rewarding criminal behavior. So, so there's, there's endless examples of this uh, that, that you could bring into, but a government must be morally good. The second thing I want to point out from these two verses is this truth that um, I want you to notice verse 2 talks about judgment. Verse 3 talks about that they are a terror to, not to good works, but to evil. He talks about the fact that they are avengers. He talks about that they execute wrath, that they bear the sword. You know, all of these different examples uh, uh, talking about the governing authority. Now, what does that mean or what does that tell us right away? They're executing, they're avenging, exercising wrath upon those who practice evil, right? They're punishing evil, rewarding good. What, what does that teach us? It teaches us that the primary role of government is to protect the citizens that are under that government's rule. To protect the citizens' uh, liberties and rights. Their God-given rights and their God-given liberties. They are to protect them and they are to punish. So there's two points. Number one, protect. Number two, punish. They're to punish the evildoers, those that infringe upon the rights and the liberties of the other citizens. Right? Are you following me now? Those two things are essential to the argument that Paul is making from, from uh, the inspired utterance of God is that these two things are essential. There is protection and there is punishment. Or you could say justice. Now, biblical justice is different than social justice. Social justice teaches the only way to make people equal is to redistribute people's wealth and give them all the same amount of everything. And that's not what biblical justice is. Biblical justice is retributive justice. It is not restorative justice. Restorative justice is the business of private citizens. It is the business of the clergy, the church, counselors, individuals that seek to bring about transformation and reformation in a person's life. It's not the business of the state. Retributive justice. Eye for an eye. Tooth for a tooth. Life for a life. Punishment that fits the crime is all that means. Right? And this is the two purposes of government. And I'm running out of time already. These are the two purposes of government. Protect. Not provide. Protect. Not welfare state. Protect. Who are they protecting? They're protecting its citizens' personal rights and liberties. Who are they protecting it from? Those who they are punishing, who are de doing evil, that are infringing upon your personal rights and your personal liberties. 
That's the only purpose of government. That's it. Now he does give us a third purpose. Uh, it's one that we don't like to talk about, but if you understand the biblical view, you'll, you'll understand it and, and support it. And he talks about them being God's ministers and that they, uh, uh, verse number 6, because of this you pay taxes for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Let me ask you a question. And I'm going to try to wrap this up somehow. Notice why, I mean, let me ask you this question. Why does the issue of taxes come here and not earlier? Why doesn't he talk about taxes in verse 1, 2, or 3? Why does he talk about the purpose of government first to protect and to punish, to protect injustice? Why, why, does, he, why does he mention it here? Because the purpose of taxes is simply to provide for the purpose of which government exists. So the taxation is not to be an excessive taxation to punish citizens. It is taxation for the purpose of raising a defense, of having a military, of having police officers, of having law enforcement, to protect the citizens, and to punish the evildoers. It is not simply taxation just for the sake of taxation to do whatever we want to do because we want to come up with a million and one different programs. It is there to provide for the purpose of which government exists. Say amen, somebody. We'd be paying a whole lot, a whole lot less taxes if that were the case today. So we can all say amen to something like that. In closing, you'll notice in verses 9 and 10 that he cites the law of God. Why? Because... The law of God is the foundation for all human law. That if human law does not mirror the law of God, it is no law at all. It would be simply despotic to uh, overthrow the rule of God, the law of God, to insert our own law. That does not mirror the law of God. The law of God ultimately comes to this conclusion in verse 10. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. It does no harm to its neighbor. Neighbor. So again, this is going back to the rule of law and why the rule of law is important. Because the rule of law necessarily dictates to us that the purpose of government, again, the purpose of the rule of law is what? Protection of the rights and liberties of its citizens and the punishment of those who do not abide by that. Because love does what? It doesn't work any ill. It doesn't work any harm to its neighbor. And government is there to protect the neighbor, to protect any infringement upon that individual. Now in closing, what in the world does this have to do with the title, and this will be very brief, what does this have to do with the title that we have today of the dangers of partisan and identity politics in a constitutional republic? And this is it. I can do this in two to three minutes. I promise. I promise. <laughs> my fingers are crossed behind my back, right? Does that, does that count? <laughs> Probably not. All right. First of all, constitutional republic. What is a constitutional republic? Uh, a republic is a nation governed by law. It's not a democracy. A democracy is, is a nation governed by the majority. The danger of a democracy is that in democracy, the majority rules, so if the majority is corrupt or perverted, they can insert and impose their will upon the minority. In a republic, you cannot have that happen because the rule of law rules over all. So that people don't control the law, the law controls the people. And if we think that we live in a society where it is a democracy and it's the majority rule, where the majority rules, the mob rules, so you re-educate the kids, you change the textbooks, change the history, change morality, make it not immorality or morality, but make it amorality, teach humanism to the kids, teach them that they're okay, all they need is self-esteem, don't teach them right and wrong, 
and begin to insert humanism into them and evolution and all of these other things. You re-educate a whole generation and then another generation and then another generation and pretty soon they'll be crying out for the very thing uh, that is an enemy of liberty and freedom. They'll cry out for democracy. They'll cry out for... And, and you know who was a supporter of, of democracy? It was Karl Marx. Karl Marx believed and he taught that the, the first step in the revolution for socialism was to win the battle for democracy. He wanted a democracy because he wanted a majority to rule because the majority could overthrow the rule of law. We do not believe that. We, we believe in a constitutional republic, a, a republic that is governed by law and that no one is above the law, everybody is submitted to the law and those laws must be moral, they must be just, they must be imaged after the law of God. So that's a, a republic, got it? Now the, the danger of partisan politics and the danger of uh, identity politics is this, party poli or, uh, partisan, party, party first, will lie, deceive, manipulate, twist, bribe, whatever we have to do to accomplish the will of the party. Identity politics. Um, uh, whether that's gender, whether that's sexuality, whether that's uh, ethnic group, color of your skin, whatever that identity is, uh, all we care about is the special interests of this identity group. We don't care about the rule of law, we just care about our group. See, the problem with both of those ideals is they uh, elevate party and identity over the rule of law. The Republic says, so, so get me, partisan says party, identity says identity, Republic says the law, the chief law, the supreme law, the law of God, law first, nothing else is essential but law. So when we begin to elevate these two things to where this is virtually all you see in politics today. Nobody considers the law and principle and standard. They consider identity. Who's going who's to be offended by this? We can't do any of this because it will offend somebody. Let them be offended. Let them be offended. The most important thing in life is not their feelings. We, we, we can't... We can't uh, uh, you know, what, what does the party want? Who cares about truth anymore? Just, what does the party want? Because whatever they say and do, that's what we're on board with. So we don't vote according to conscience, we vote, vote according to party. Now how does this apply to us? It applies to us, and here's the, the application, closing application. This, the, these same things are in the church today. We have these same things, these same characteristics in the church. Partisanship. Well, we're just going to go with the flow of our church or our denomination because that's all we've ever known. That's all we've ever done. And it's party first, church first, denomination first. And this is the way we do it. Even though they err from the truth, even though they're no longer a gospel-centered, Christ-preaching, Christ-exalting, truth-lifting up denomination, let us go with the flow. We'll go with the flow. We'll pay our dues. Partisanship. You're just going along with them because that's all you ever know. And then identity. How many churches are consumed? How many churches just in the last number of weeks acting like complete fools by supporting Black Lives Matter? Now, are you kidding me? Have you gone on their website and read their beliefs before you endorse them and sponsor them and put it on your Facebook and all over the Internet and you do messages supporting that? And you don't even look up to see that they're, they're against the nuclear family. They don't want husband and wife and children. And, and, and you want to endorse that type of thinking, that type of ideology? I mean, we live in a society where all lives matter is racist and black lives matter is not. What's wrong with you? We 
get out of his partisan identity garbage and stand for truth, stand for the gospel, have, go by what is a principled decision, not what does the mob tell you, not what does the party say, not what does my denomination say, what well, does our denomination sponsor this or support this? No, what does the scripture say? What does the word of God say? What does the supreme law, the supreme judge of the world say? And follow him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for helping us to see the role and purpose of government and its limitations and helping us to see how this applies to us relevantly today, not only in our society, but also in the church, because let's just face it, the church has become uh, just like the world, just like the culture it lives in, filled with compromise, filled with lies, filled with deceit, filled with bowing the knee uh, to leftist programs and leftist ideology that has nothing to do with Scripture. God, forgive us, help us, strengthen us, and help us to be courageous in the times to come. In Jesus' name, amen.